afternoon. I hope you have a pad and paper, and I hope that you'll make notes of all that I give you this afternoon. If you're like I am, you go to a meeting like this and you can't remember everything that you get. And I have just a simple way of teaching people what I know. I teach them and tell them to make notes of it and write it down, take it, use it, and apply it later. And what I'll teach you this afternoon is the very things that I teach to our bus workers on a weekly basis. Some of the things we'll cover this afternoon. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, the Bible says, Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Let's pray and ask God now to add His blessing to this service. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again today for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and for His death and our place upon the cross. We come now in His name according to the promise of your word, asking that you might reach down from heaven and fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray, our Father, as we share with these people this afternoon things about the bus ministry, that you might use it to stir them to do greater things for Jesus Christ. Undertake here now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I want to talk to you first of all this afternoon of exactly how we teach our people to go about starting a bus ride. I mean point by point, and you make a note of it. Write it down. I think it'll help you. Even if you're not a bus worker, I believe it will. Number one, ask God's wisdom in knowing the area where to start a bus route. Select the area using the wisdom of God. The Bible says in James 1, 5, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Last fall, I drove up the expressway one day praying about a place where to start a bus route. We had a fellow by the name of Earl Yates that wanted a bus, and I was praying about a place to start this man on a bus route. As I drove along, I saw a sign that said North Avenue. For some reason, that rang a responsive chord in my heart. Heaven's in the north, and I thought, surely there must be a little bit of heaven on North Avenue. Two days later, I came back and I got off at North Avenue and I found that there was a little bit of heaven on North Avenue. We started our first bus there, I believe, the last Sunday of of September or the first Sunday of October, one of the two, and God blessed in an unusual way. And we've added, I don't know exactly right now how many buses we have running off of North Avenue. I did do this so Sunday. I added up all of those buses that run off of in, in and around North Avenue and for a period, uh, uh, a rectangle, if you draw a rectangle, we run eight blocks north of North Avenue and about four blocks south of North Avenue. And if you go through there for a period of two miles, this past Sunday, we had 1,827 bodies, all of them breathing, ride the buses off of around North Avenue. Now, I believe God led us to that area. You might not believe that, but I believe that it is. Number two. Bathe the area in prayer. Bathe the area in prayer. Nothing happens apart from God's people exercising the avenue of prayer. You bus captains are here this afternoon. How many bus captains, bus workers do we have here this afternoon? Lift your hand. You need to pray for your bus route every day. Every day. You ought to pray for it. On a daily basis, you ought to go to the throne of God and ask God, to bless the people on your bus route and meet the needs of those people. A bus captain that doesn't pray for his route every day will not have the success of God. You remember that. Bathe it in prayer. Number three, walk all over the area. Walk all over the area. In Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There's a misconception among many folks, and I know people that believe that buses are just to be used to reach children. I don't think that's scriptural. I don't think it's right. Acts 5.42 says, Daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Every house is in there for a reason. Paul gave the method he used for success in Acts 20.20. He said that I cease not to warn you publicly and from house to house. Now, I'm not against you driving out in the neighborhood and just looking for children. I don't think that's wrong, but I do believe this. I believe that we'll be much more scripturally correct to get out and go from door to door and knock on every door. I think that because God tells us to do it. Now, it causes problems. You'll reach all kinds of people that that you wouldn't reach otherwise. You'll you'll have the dogs get after them. 
I mean, uh, uh, you'll get doors slammed in your face and it'll take time that you don't necessarily have. But you'll be more scripturally correct than you will any other way if you follow up. And you'll do this. You'll wear calluses on the back of your hands, on your knuckles from knocking on hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of doors. But that pleases God. That pleases God. And you ought to do it. You ought to. I remember knocking on doors one day up in Roanoke, Virginia. We had five buses running there when I directed the bus ministry at Thomas Road Baptist Church when I left. And we were knocking on doors up there one day and I knocked on the door and the lady came to the door about 80 years old. She, she didn't have a right mind. She was kind of goofy. And I talked to her a little bit and she had me spinning around like that. And so I said, the bus captain wants to talk to you. Is there anybody else here? And she said, my husband's inside. And I went in there and there's a man sitting in there, 86 years old, lived with her for 40 years. She got him. Long time ago, brother, he, he, he didn't have half of his right mind. And I talked to him for a little bit, and I said, is anybody else here? He said, yes, my wife's brother's out in the backyard. I said, well, I'm going out to talk to him. And I went out there. He's a one-legged man sitting out there smoking a pipe. No, he's smoking a cigar and chewing tobacco. He had a, he had a plug in the back of his mouth, had a Folgers coffee can sitting about five, six foot away, and every five minutes his head had kind of turned slowly to the right and a brown stream would emit from his house and hit his mouth and hit that can every time. He, did, he didn't miss it a time. I never wanted to spit so bad in my life as I did, sitting there watching that fellow. I talked to him a little while, had his leg cut off right here and had his bitch's leg rolled up in a, in a uh, clothespin over the, the stump like that. And I talked to him for a while and didn't get anywhere with him at all. Had a box of kitchen matches sitting there on the table, and so I picked up the box of matches, and I took out two, stuck one back in it, with the head sticking out. And I reached down, and I flipped his clothespin off his britches leg. He says, what are you going to do? I said, you watch me. And I undid his britches, and I stuck that box of matches up in there and rolled it back up and put that pin back over it like that and took that other match, kind of walled my eyes around like his sister inside had done, and struck that match and started down towards that other one like that. He said, what in the world's the matter with you? He said, are you some kind of a fool? I said, no, but you ought to trust your soul. Uh, hell, it's a lot hotter than this fire I can build on your leg today. An old boy said two of the prettiest words I've ever heard. He said, I'll come. <laughs> Jesus said, compel them to come in. I hadn't thought about it while I was doing it to him, you see. He said, I'll come. The next day, he rode the bus. One-legged man, 55 miles, one way, rode the bus. Come in. I said, George, his name is George Harry. And I said, George, I'll show you where to sit. I marched him in, brought him down. He sat on the second row. Brother Falwell preached that morning, gave the invitation. And one of the first people down the aisle to get saved that day was that one-legged man. You know how we got him? By doing what Jesus said to do, go from door to door. That's the scriptural plan that you and I ought to follow on the bus route. The purpose of our running buses is to get people saved, get people born to give, and you and I ought to be out there doing it daily, door to door. All right? Number four. Let me give you some practices to follow while you're out going from door to door. Some practical points that will help you. First of all, practice being observant. As you walk down a sidewalk and you see a house, look, what you, look at what you see and think about it. Force yourself to concentrate. Use your mind. Most of God's people don't think enough. When, you, when somebody comes to the door, look at that person. Look at them. Concentrate upon them. And the more that you can know about them, the better able you'll be to talk to them about their soul if you don't have to ask them questions about it. If you'll be observant, you can be a lot farther down the line than other people are. The, the next practice is this. Practice walking rapidly. Practice walking rapidly. I get all over preachers because most preachers put on that I'm going to a funeral gate when they go anywhere and they kind of walk slow. I get on preachers. Listen, when you're out on a bus route and you're walking, going from door to door, you ought to walk so people will see you and believe that you've got a little life in your bones. We've got a lady by the name of Mrs. Bartell at 69 years old and she'll out walk the legs off of most of you Adults here today, 69 years old. Mrs. Snow, one of the bus captains I had while I was at Thomas Road Baptist Church, just recently died, went home to be with the Lord. 58-year-old woman. She could walk, brother. I mean, she would walk. All right? 
What's your purpose? To get people saved. Now, when you walk fast, you show people that you have life. So practice walking rapidly. The next thing, when you knock on a door, don't walk up to a door and... That's disgusting. When you knock on the door, the trademark for this church and you people that are bus workers ought to be this. You ought to scare the fire out of people when you knock. Knock on the door, loudly. Knock. When they hear that knock, they ought to know that's somebody from Forest Hills Baptist Church. One of those nuts over there with those buses are coming over to bother us again. The next thing, practice smiling. When people come to the door... Smile at it. Smile at it. If you don't like your smile with your teeth in, take them out. But smile. Smile. You won't build a bus route unless you're friendly. You won't build a bus route unless you're friendly. Practice smiling. The Bible says he that has friends must show himself friendly. And you must show yourself that way. All right? Point number five. Your introduction. Your introduction should be clear, concise, Simple and to the point. You ought to say the same thing over and over again. You'll become proficient at it if you say it over and over again. See? By the way, it isn't how much you know that will make a success out of you. It's how well you know what little you know. It's how well you know what little you know. All right? I walk up to the door. I use one of these brochures right here when I'm surveying. You can have one of these. They're free for the taking one to a family. I walk up to the door and they come to the door. I say, I'm Brother Vineyard from First Baptist of Hamlet. We have a Sunday school bus running in this area. I wanted to stop and invite you folks to come and visit us. Do you attend Sunday school regularly anywhere? And I always end that introduction with that question. Now I'll run through it again. You might write it down. I'm Brother Vineyard from First Baptist of Hammond. We have a Sunday school bus running in this area. I wanted to stop and invite you folks to come and visit us. Do you attend Sunday school regularly anywhere? Always end it that way. Now, expect 90% of the people that you say that to to give you some sort of religious affiliation. Expect that. When you knock on their door, 9 out of 10 homes that you talk, talk to, expect them to tell you that they go to church somewhere. All right? Point number six. They'll say, we go somewhere. All right, you come right back in point number six and say this. Do you go every Sunday? Do you go every Sunday? Do you go every Sunday? Excited life. Look at it. Do you go every Sunday? A moment ago you asked them do you attend regularly. Well, they'll lie about it. And then you come right back and you say, do you go every Sunday? Do you go every Sunday? Now, the person's got to tell you the truth. You know what he'll do? That quick he'll say, yes, we do. The fellow that's got to tell you the truth, he'll say, yes, we do. Yes, we do. But the guy that's going to lie to you, you know what he'll do? He, he'll be looking at you when you ask him, do you go every Sunday? And when you say, do you go every Sunday, if he's going to lie to you, here's what he'll do. He'll look away like that, and then he'll come right back to you. That's what a liar does. You check him, brother, you check him. They'll look away. They'll, you, you can be looking at him, and you can ask him, do you go every Sunday? And they'll look away, and they'll come. You know what they did that for? That gives them time to think up an answer, think up a lie. All right, when they look away, now, point number seven is this. When you see that, that hesitation right there, come out with this. How about on the Sundays you don't go to your church, let your kids come and ride our bus? Now, I'll say that if you notice they have children. How about on the Sundays you don't go to your church, let your kids come and ride our bus? How about on the Sundays you don't go to your church, let your kids come and ride our bus? Now, that'll make some folks mad because they'll say you're proselyting. By the way, the people that get mad about you saying that are those that are not doing anything. That's the people who get upset about that. The guy that's out there doing something, he doesn't worry about that. His motive is to get people under the sound of the Word of God. That's what your motive ought to be, to get people under the Word of God so they'll get saved. But ask them. Man, how about on the Sundays you don't go to your church, let your kids come and ride our bus? All right, the next thing, the next number. Tell of your love for children. Tell of your love for children. Man, we love kids. We have hundreds of them ride our buses. I used to say we have thousands, but that sounds too big, and so I don't say it anymore. We have hundreds of them ride our buses. We'd love to have yours come. By the way, bus captain, love is the greatest single element that you have going for you in building a bus ride. 
Love is, is the greatest single element. I know bus captains, that, I'm in favor of promotion. I'll talk about it in a little bit. I know bus captains that never use a promotion on their bus route who, through the use of love because they love people and they tell people that they love them and they show people that they love them will build great bus routes. And I know other captains that don't love folks and they never do what these others do. All right? Tell them you love them. And by the way, you know what the greatest element of opposition is caused from in your church about the bus ministry? The lack of love on the part of the Pharisees that sit in the pews. That's popular. I ought to hang up there a little while. <laughs> the lack of love on the part of the Pharisees that sit in the pews. You know what love is? Every Sunday morning in my junior church service, and by the way, you can have a picture of this, the Sunday that we made this picture here, we had 2,617 people in the main auditorium for our B junior church service, and I preached to them in there that Sunday, we gave the invitation, had 348 saved, but that was five weeks ago, day before yesterday. Anyway, every Sunday, after I preach in there, and I give the invitation, the kids come forward, and we send them out to two side doors, and they take them over in the work building. And they deal with them over there about their soul. Well, while they're over there dealing with them, I've got all the rest of the kids left in all the tour, and I've just got some dead time waiting on, on dismissal. So what I do, I bring a microphone, I came, come down in front, and I ask, is there any of you little boys, and li or any of you little girls, not boys, any of you little girls in here today like to come up here and give Brother Vineyard sugar? Line up down the middle aisle. They line up down the middle aisle, and I get down there, and I take a microphone, and I hold it, and I lean over, and they come up through there, and they give me sugar on both cheeks. This past Sunday, now we count. Every time a child gives me sugar, we count. All of us together, you know, and they watch. This past Sunday, we started out one, two, three, four, five, right on up, see. And then it's 181, 182, 183. 183 little old girls lined up down that middle aisle and come up there and gave me sugar. We got done. Both sides of my face were gooey. <laughs> you know what that is? Nasal mucus. <laughs> Bus kids call that snot. <laughs> if you don't love kids, you better stay out of the bus ministry. Amen. I was in a church not long ago, and a fellow came up to me, and he said, well, he said, Brother Vineyard, I'm in favor of the buses, but he said, these bus people, they stink so bad in church. I said, you ought to try one of them, try riding on one of these buses when you get 70, 80, 90 bodies jammed on the bus and the heater going in the wintertime. All those smells start circulating all over that bus. Listen, that'll open up your sinuses. <laughs> tell them you love them. The next thing, tell about your purpose. We teach the Bible. We teach the Bible. We believe the Bible. We practice the Bible. We preach the Bible. We teach the Bible. The Bible is the greatest. Weapon you have. Now, today, there's lots of churches don't believe the Bible. Lots of preachers don't believe the Bible. I have less respect for, for a preacher that doesn't believe the Bible than I do anybody. He's lowering a snake's belly. I mean, uh, snakes ought to crawl over him. He's that low. Uh, but anyway, the, the greatest selling point in lots of areas today in the bus ministry is the fact that at your church, you teach the Bible, you believe the Bible, you preach the Bible. Emphasize that. The next number. Tell about what we call to-your-door service. To-your-door service. Tell about that. To-your-door service. I'm standing at the door talking to Mrs. Jones, and I'll, I'll tell her, I'll say, Now, Mrs. Jones, here's what happens on Sunday. The bus comes down out in front of the, uh, the, your house on the street there. The captain gets off the bus. He comes up knocks on your door. He gets your children by the hand, takes them out, puts them on the bus. The bus goes to church. The captain gets off the bus. He lines up the children by, by the age groups. One, two, three, four, five, six, right on up. He lines them up. He gets in front of them. And he takes them around and drops them off at their respective Sunday school classes. They're taught the Bible there. They're preached to then in church. When church is over, the bus captain picks them up, takes them out, puts them back on the bus. The bus comes down in front of the, the street out there. And he gets off the bus and he brings your two children right back to your door. Now, Mrs. Jones, that's to your door service. You can't beat that, can you? You know what that lady will do? She'll say, no, you can't beat that. You know what you've done? If you're a good salesman, you'll divert her attention off of going to church 
and you'll put it on two year door service. See? Now, do that. Do that. How many do you have on your bus route Sunday, Dave? 263. Stand up. Brother Dave Nelms, he's from this church. He's one of our preacher boys at, at Hiles Anderson College. He had 263 on his bus route Sunday. On how many buses? Four buses. That's pretty good average. That's pretty good average on four buses. Over 60 average. Almost seven. See? Now, he and his workers, when they get to church, get off of the bus, line the children up, and take them around for through four stories of buildings and drop them off at every Sunday school class. By the way, you people here today, you'll cause this church and your church, if you're not a member of this church, you'll cause the bus ministry to have opposition because you let the kids off out in front of the church and don't take them to the Sunday school class. Don't pull up in front of the church and say, Kids, here it is. Now take it. Because they will. Bus kids don't know you're not supposed to run over folks. You asked Dr. Jack Hyde. You remember him telling about it? He was coming down the corridor not too long ago, six or seven weeks ago, and seven of our junior age bus kids was coming the other way. Now, Brother Howes walks pretty fast, but and he's a pretty good-sized man, but when seven juniors run over you, you know what happens to you? You go down just like anybody else does, and he'll holler, Hey, hey, come back here! And they kept going. They were bus kids. I saw him that night, and I said, he was telling me about it, and I said, all right, don't you ever mess with me. I said, I'll turn them all loose on you. <laughs> but see, don't just drop them off in front of the church, because they'll develop opposition to your bus ministry because you do that. Take them to their Sunday school class. All right, the next number. If the children are there, begin now, before you ask the mama for an answer, begin to talk to the children. You two boys, come up here if you would. You two boys, come up here. And the little girl right there, come up here. Right quickly. Come on, fellas. Come on. And this man right here. You come on up here, brother. All right, now, I'm talking to this man, and he's got three children. Come on, buddy. Come on, right quick. Come on. He's got three children. I'm standing here talking to him. I've told him all that I've told you already. Okay? Now, he's got three kids. Now, I'm going to just give you you three kids to this man, and I'm going to use your first name but his last name. What's your last name? Minyard. Mr. Minyard. He's one of the bus captains here. All right? I'm standing at the door talking to him. Now... Look at the children and pick out a key person. Write this down. A key person among the children. That's the person who's friendliest to you. Now, that's the person you're going to talk to last. That's the person that you're going to use to get the rest of them to promise to come. All right? I look at the children. Let's say, now we've got two boys and a girl. Let's say just for argument's purposes, the boy on the end appears to be friendlier to me. He doesn't appear, but let's say that he does. Now, a situation like this, lots of times I wouldn't pick out the girl. You know why? The two boys might not follow the leadership of the girl, especially the older brother, see. And I might have problems, okay? But if the boy, if the biggest child looks like he's halfway friendly to me, I'll use him as my key person. You kids just kind of swing on around here if you would. I don't, I don't have to turn. Just come on around here, buddy. Come on around, around here. All right, now, I, I look at the children, and I start talking to them. Always carry bubble gum, and give it out liberally while you visit. That makes friends with them. Carry something like that. All right, I stick my hand in my pocket, I hold out a piece of bubble gum this boy, and I say, hey, buddy, what's your name? What's your name? Mark. How old are you, Mark? Eight, Eight years old. You're a fine-looking boy. Where'd you get all those freckles? You don't know. I asked a kid that the other day, some time ago, he said, from the freckle maker. <laughs> now, let me show you something. Try to get these people to laugh. Try to get them to laugh. What grade are you in school, buddy? Three. You like school? Yeah. You do. What do you like best about school? Lunch and recess? Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. All right, talk to him a little bit. Now, end with him and tell him, say, Mark, I sure would like to have you come and ride that bus Sunday. Shake your head up and down all the time when you talk to kids. All right, go to the girl. What's your name, sweetheart? Cookie. How old are you, Cookie? Eight years old. What grade are you in in school? Second grade. You like school? Boy, that's good. Now, let me show you something. Let's say that I was talking to Cookie and this was her mother instead of her father. Cookie's got pretty brown eyes. And let's say I noticed that her mother's got pretty brown eyes. I'd look at Cookie and I'd say, Boy, you sure do have pretty brown eyes. I like pretty brown eyes. Where did you get those pretty brown eyes? And I wouldn't necessarily give her a chance to answer me. See, now, I might just go and keep talking. 
I'm not really trying to impress her. I'm impressing somebody else. Women are suckers. Now, if you'll just remember that. Men aren't usually, but women are. And women, you know what a woman will do? She'll give you two points for that. She'll give you two points. All right, I talked to Cookie a little bit, and I wind up with Cookie by saying, Cookie, I sure would like to have you come and ride that bus Sunday. All right, I go to my key person. Now, I've got to sell this kid right here on riding a bus. I've got to sell him. I'll usually spend a little bit more time talking to him than I will the rest of them. I won't this afternoon because of time. But I'll look at him. I'll say, what's your name, buddy? Wayne, how old are you? Nine years old. You're a fine-looking boy. Wayne, what grade are you in school? Fourth grade. You like school? You do. Are you a baseball player? Basketball player? What, what do you do? Do you play sports? Sometimes. What do you play? Football. Are you going to be an end or a quarterback? End. You're going to be an end. That's good. You're going to be a tall fella. Wayne, I sure would like to have you come and ride that bus Sunday. You'd like to come, wouldn't you? You would. Would you come? You would. Would you come if Dad let you come? You would. Hey, Cookie, you'd like to come if he comes, wouldn't you? You would. Would you come if he comes? You would. Would you come if he comes? You don't know. Now, see, she's messing up. Let me show you something. All right, just skip her. She's bashful. Skip her. Look at Mark. Mark, you'd like to come if he comes, wouldn't you? You would. Would you come if he comes? You would. Would you come if Dad let you come? You would. How about it, Daddy? Would you let him come? I'm going to tell you like you to tell me when I'm talking to him. I'll tell you about it. That's what they do. Sixty percent of the people you talk to will say that right there. I'll study about it. I'll think about it. Well, I don't know. Sixty percent. But thirty percent of the people you talk to will say, okay. Now, there's ten percent that will just fiddle around. But three out of ten homes that you do this to, if you do it properly, will say, yes, they can. Now, if you do it properly, if you get the children sold, and you, now let me show you something else. A child at home is not going to be as embarrassed as a child up in front of a bunch of adults. You remember that. And a child at home will go along with you a lot easier than a child in front of a bunch of adults. Okay, now, let me run through what I said to you a moment ago about it, and let's go through it again. I'll start with Wayne again. Wayne, I'd like to have you come and ride that bus Sunday. You'd like to come, wouldn't you? You would. Would you come? You would. Would you come if Dad let you come? You would. Hey, Cookie, you'd like to come if he comes, wouldn't you? You would. Would you come if he comes? You would. Would you come if Dad let you come? You would. Mark, you'd like to come if they come, wouldn't you? You would. Would you come if they come? You would. Would you come if Dad let you come? You would. How about it, Daddy? Would you let them come? This is another one of the remarks. They can come if they want to. They can come if they want to. All right. They've said they want to. You let them come. Yes. Great. Kids, I'm going to be looking for them. See. Now, they can come if they want to. Each one of them said they'd like to. See, you're selling the children and you're selling the daddy at the same time. Do a good selling job and you'll get 60% of them that will give you that I don't know, but you'll get 30% of them to say definitely I will come. Well, all you got to do is go out and find that 30%. See, any salesman that sells anything, if he can sell 30% of the people he talks to, he'll be a millionaire. You remember that. All right, thank you, folks. Sit down. Okay, the next thing. Don't push the daddy our mother, and get a definite no. Don't push this fella or woman and get a definite no. Let him procrastinate. He says what he said there a moment ago. Reiterate everything you've told him. Look at him and say, all right, Mr. Bennett, you do this. You talk to your wife about it. Or you think about it. You remember this. Now, we love children. We teach them the Bible. We'll pick them up at the door, take them to church, take them off the bus into their Sunday school class, teach them the Bible, teach, preach to them in, on their age level, pick them up, put them back on the bus, and bring them back to your door. You think about that. I'll be back out here Saturday or sometime later on in the week. I have to be out here anyway, and I'll stop by to let you know why the, what time the bus comes by on Sunday. You think about it. If children can come, we'd love to have them come. Now, don't get him to say a definite no. Don't get him to say a definite no. And by the way, do this. When you knock on the door, believe that you're going to get children. Don't you go up to the door thinking about their excuses. That's one reason you don't get right. Because you spend more time thinking about all the excuses you get from other people. Just forget about that. If you get an excuse at one door, go next door believing you're going to get these people. There's something about that that will provide riders for you. And I never listen to a bus captain that comes to me and starts telling me about all the excuses he gets. You know why? He's looking at his excuses. Isn't that right, Dave? I don't go for that stuff. I don't buy that one bit. I, don't, I, I know this. 
you're going to get a lot more excuses than you do yeses. Just look for the yeses and forget about the excuses. And you'll have 265 on your buses. Do that. All right, the next thing. Regardless of what answer you've got about the children, look that man dead in the eye and ask him this question. Mr. Manion, do you know if you died right now, do you know you'd go to heaven? Look that man or woman. If they told you the kids can come, look him dead in the eye and ask him, do you know right now if you died, do you know you'd go to heaven? Why do you do that? Because that's what they're out there for. That's why you're there. That's the reason of what you're doing. Look him dead in the eye and ask him that. The next thing, you've got to put him on the spot when you ask him that, so the next thing you should do is give him your testimony. Give him your testimony. Look him in the eye and say, let me tell you what the Lord did for me. In a motel room in Moline, Illinois, September the 17th, 1964, I realized if I died, I'd go to hell. And that night, beside my bed, at 10.45 p.m., I got down on my knees and asked Jesus to come into my heart and save my soul. I have something today I don't deserve. I deserve to go to hell, but if I die, Jesus is going to take me to heaven. And see, you've relieved the pressure on him when you put him on the spot by asking him, as you know, if he died, to go to heaven, by turning right around and giving him your testimony. By the way, one reason I like surveys, I get to give my testimony over and over again, over and over again. Listen, I get excited about it, brother. You people get over giving your testimony. I feel sorry for you. I, I told you just then about how God saved me and goosebumps bumped down my spine. It does every time I do it. You say, it doesn't affect me that way. Maybe you don't have a testimony. If you'll see me after the service, I'll fix you up with one and you can give it everywhere tomorrow. <laughs> the next thing... <laughs> The next thing, give them a track and ask them to read it. Give them a track and ask them to read it. Get a good gospel track and give it to them and ask them to read it. The next thing, ask them if you can come back later. Ask them if you can come back later to show them how to be saved. Ask them if you can come back later to show them how to be saved. Lots of times what I'll do is I'll hand them the track and talk to them about it and tell them, that I can show, it'll, it'll show them how to be saved. I'll get out my Bible and I'll make out like I'm leaving. I'll start backing up. And I'll say, by the way, if you check yourself out in that and you found that that hasn't happened to you, maybe I could come out later and show you how to be saved. Would you be interested in that? And, and if they think you're leaving, usually they'll agree to let you come back later. Now, that's what you want. See, you want them to agree to let you come back later. Why? You'll knock on the door sometime later. Might be tonight. And you'll say, you told me I could come back later to see you, show you how to be saved. I've had folks say, well, come on in. I'll walk right in and sit down. Not say one word about anything else. Just sit down and get the Bible out and start showing them and lead them to Jesus Christ. I've done that many times. But ask them if you can come back later. The next thing, write down all information that you get on every home. Put down the daddy's name, where he works, everything about him, the mother, the children, their ages. The telephone number and all that. Now, by the way, lots of times you'll have to go out in the street to write this information down, particularly if you're working in a middle-class neighborhood. But write it down. The next thing, write down all of the information on the house numbers where nobody's home. If you knock on the door and nobody's at that, at that home, then write that house number down. Why? So you can come and see those people at a, at a different time of the week later on different time of the day, later on in the week, but write their house number down. And then the last thing, make out some sort of a bus book or arch board or whatever type administrative forms that you use that way. Well, make out a bus book. Put the, put the stops in there in the order that you'd be picking them up. Fill that up. Now, that's the way we teach our people to start a bus route. The, last Sunday night, one of our bus captains, I was with him on his bus route surveying Oh, three weeks ago, I guess it was, and we, we were knocking on doors and we let a, we let a lady to the Lord. And the bus captain went back to see that, that lady on Saturday and was going to try to lead the husband to the Lord. We were just going from door to door and, and she had promised that she'd come and ride the bus the next day and walk the aisle and she was all upset because her husband got mad because she got saved. Wasn't going to let her come to church. And so the bus captain run his bus then on Sunday and he come in to me and he was kind of discouraged about it. And he said, Brother Vineyard, she didn't come. Her husband's not going to let her come. He said, what should I do? I said, take your bus when you run her out this afternoon, drop everybody off, get everybody off of the bus and then drive the bus over to the man's house 
and go see. And he won't be expecting you on Sunday afternoon. He said, okay, that's what I'll do. So he drove over to the house, and the fellow saw the bus pull up in front of the house, and he run in the back bedroom and hid. And the man walked up and knocked on the door, and the lady come to the door, and the man said, the bus captain said, is your husband home? And she said, yeah, he just went back in the bedroom and hid. And so the bus captain said, well, let me in. And she let him in. And so the bus captain, I, you, you ought to be aggressive, brother. Don't be afraid of people. This bus captain, he went on back to this bedroom door, and the bedroom door was closed. And the bus captain, very loudly, on that bedroom door, and that man said, what do you want? said, I want to talk to you. So the fellow said, come in. <laughs> he went in the bedroom and sat down on an unmade bed and led that man to Jesus Christ. And then that night, that couple came and walked the aisle and followed the Lord in believers' baptism. Last Sunday night, two of their children got saved and walked the aisle and got baptized. How'd that happen? Because we were going from door to door doing what Jesus said to do. Starting a bus ride. All right? That's how we teach our captains to start around. What do you do the first Sunday you run the bus? The first Sunday you run the bus. I'm going to give you 12 points. You can do some of these things the first Sunday. You can do some of them every Sunday. Write them down. They'll help you. Number one, pick up every child at the door. Get off the bus and go to the door and get the children. Get off of the bus and go to the door and get the children. Now, use your head. There's some children. That boy right there, Wayne. If you went to the door and you got Wayne... He wouldn't want to hold your hand to walk out to the bus. But you can show other people in the neighborhood that you care for children and you'll take care of them by picking Wayne up at his door. Do you follow me? And you can just walk out like two men with him, see? All right? The next thing, number two, show every person love. Tell them you love them. You go up to the door and you get him and say, Hey, Wayne, I love you, buddy, and I sure am glad you rode the bus today. There's not many people that outside of good Christian people that tell one another that they love them. And it doesn't hurt you to tell somebody you love them. Oh, it blesses my soul when my bus workers walk up to me. And some of them do it every Sunday and say, Brother Vinny, I want you to know I appreciate you and love you, man. And I have to cry every, every time one of them tells me that. I like to be loved. I like, and this old world likes to be loved. It needs to be loved. And the people that are doing the job for God are the ones that will tell them that they love. Dr. Jack Hiles, I've heard him tell it many times about how as a little boy, five years old, without shoes on, he went to Sunday school for the first time in his life, and a godly Sunday school pe teacher picked him up and hugged him to her, to her breast and said, Jackie boy, God loves you, and I love you too. And he said the effect that that had upon his life, knowing that somebody loved him, he's never forgotten it. So the first Sunday that a child rides your bus, tell that child you love them and continue to do it. The third thing, make every person feel at ease. Make every person feel at ease. Have you ever been to a strange church and while you were there you felt ill at ease? Look around and think about that. Make people feel at ease while they ride your bus. Number four, have some sort of exciting program going on on the bus. Don't just let the kids sit on the bus and, and become bored. They'll become mischievous and they'll keep other people from coming back or they'll become bored and they'll not come back. So have something going on. Sing songs. Do something. Count all the Volkswagens you see or count the, the, the telephone poles or do something. I mean, have something going on at all times. We, we have fellas that, uh, we have fellas that have clowns ride their bus or gospel music, magicians. Uh, we, we, we've got one fellow that's got a gorilla suit. And a gorilla rides one of our buses about every Sunday. I mean, uh, you know, it, that really shakes up the Pharisees and the neighboring churches, brother. They see a gorilla driving a bus down the street, and they look at that bus like that, and they run. you got a church over here that's against the bus ministry. Just put a gorilla on, as a driver on one of your buses and let him go over and turn around in the parking lot and let him look at that for a while. <laughs> Have something going on on the bus. Number five, mark the children with some sort of identification. What we do, we take a ballpoint pen and write the bus route number on the back of the hand of the children. We've done that for years. At First Baptist, I did that at Thomas Road also. Number six, take each child to his or her Sunday school class. Take them off of the bus, take them into their Sunday school class. Take them right to their Sunday school class. I emphasized that a moment ago. Number seven, advise them what's going to happen next. Advise them what's going to happen next. When you take them into their Sunday school class, say, Billy, you'll be in here for Sunday school. When church is over, we'll pick you up, put you back on the bus. 
You'll be in here for Sunday school and church or whatever. Uh, the teacher's going to bring you to the main auditorium or what, what's going to happen? Let them know. Number eight, if necessary, transfer them between Sunday school and church. If necessary, the bus captain should go get that kid and pick him up after Sunday school and bring him into the church service or where he's supposed to go. Number nine, sit with them in the church service. Sit with them. Another reason that most churches get opposition to their bus ministry is because they let the bus kids come into the main service and sit and do whatever they want to. Don't do that. The, the Sunday school workers and the bus captains ought to look for kids sitting. If you see a row of kids up here, and I'll just kids sitting, get up before the service starts and go up there and sit among them. And keep them quiet. Sit with them. The next thing, pick them up after church and put them back on the bus. Pick them up after church and put them back on the bus. The next thing, have an even more exciting program going home. If you had one gorilla going towards the ch church, get you a gorilla and an eight for the ride home. I mean, but make it more exciting. It ought to really be alive. There's where you lose your riders. Everybody's tired after church is over. They get on the bus and they're kind of drug out. And tempers will flare. There's where you'll have your fights. We have a lot of fights on our buses. Those North Chicago kids like to fight. I mean, and they fight. And we had a boy the other day took a lead pipe and put 17 stitches in the head of another bus kid. I mean, last, last summer, I mean, sorry, last fall, during a, a short period last fall, we confisqu confiscated 27 switchblade knives off of our North Chicago buses. Now, those kids ride those buses are mean, and they'll cut your throat. And they, but on the way home, you better have something going on, or you'll have a lot of throats cut. <laughs> the last thing, take them off of the bus and take them back to their door. Take them off of the bus and take them back to their door and tell their parents you're glad they came. Tell your, their parents. Mrs. Jones, I sure am glad you let these kids ride the bus this morning. I love them and appreciate it. And by the way, if a child has any sort of an accident at church or anything has happened to that child, you be the one to go to the door and tell the parent about it. You'll keep them coming that way. If a child rides your bus and loses his or her coat, which happens lots of times, We've averaged 5,358 for the last five weeks, and I suppose we've averaged losing five purses and three or four coats every Sunday for the last five weeks, too. Now, I tell our bus captains, if that happens on your bus, you go to the door and you tell the parent about it. Don't let that parent find it out from the child. Have enough courage to go tell them. Now, by the way, that'll keep them coming if you'll do that. Now, that's what we do the first run Sunday. You can do some of those things every Sunday. You should do some of them every Sunday. You should do some of them every time that a child rides your bus for the very first time. You say, boy, that's a lot of work. It is. But if you'll do it, you'll build a bigger bus route than you would have otherwise. Do it. God will bless you for it. All right, let's go ahead and let's talk about bus captains' responsibilities. Some things that we require of our bus captains. Our bus captains. I'm going to give you ten items on this. Number one, it's elementary, but every bus captain should be saved. He should be saved. Number two, every bus captain must, M-U-S-T, underline that, put it in parentheses or quotation marks, capitalize it. Every bus captain must be separated. Separated. In Romans chapter 12, in verses 1 and 2, Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of Christ, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul said, yield your body holy. And then he said, and be not conformed to this world. That word conform means patterned. Be not patterned to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God says, present your body holy so God can use your body to prove his will. What's his will? The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter 3, 9. Now, it's a must for God's people to do his work in the way that God wants it done. At First Baptist Church, we do not have any bus workers, period, who smoke. I'm sorry, you don't smoke. Cigarette does. All you are is a sucker. We don't have any of that, brother. 
Uh, most people they say they smoke, don't smoke a cigarette. They smoke something's got a filter on it. I mean, if you're going to smoke, get you a Chesterfield or a Camel or a Pall Mall. Something when you smoke, it gives you a little nicotine in there to cough out the next morning. You know, when you get up, you feel like you got a band around your chest and you hack it for 30 minutes. You sissy, if you're going to smoke, get you something to make you cough. Get a man cigarette, you coward. But we don't have anybody working on our buses that smoke. We don't have anybody that drinks. We don't have anybody that attends worldly amusements. We don't have any men that have long hair. Amen. Why? First Corinthians eleven fourteen. Does not even nature itself teach the shame for man to have long hair? Some time ago, I fired a fellow let his hair grow. We don't pay him anything. We call it hiring and firing. Fired him because he let his hair grow too long. He said, you can't tell me how long I can wear my hair. I said, I know that. He said, well, give me the definition of long. I said, I don't know the definition, but I do know this. It's the opposite of short. Yours ain't that. And I said, you're fired. And that was it. And we don't have anybody to let their hair grow out. And get long. See, here's the problem. Here's the world right here, and here's Christianity. And the world's moving. It seems like it's got a 25-foot rope on Christianity. Going just like it. Here's the way it should be. See, it ought to go like this. Christians ought to stay right where. If something was wrong 25 years ago, it's still wrong today. Well, I got stirred up yesterday. I was preaching in Houston, Texas, beating on the pulpit like that, and I caved the whole pulpit down. <laughs> I think that's something we ought to get stirred up about. Amen. By the way, we don't have any ladies who wear short dresses. Amen. A lady that's going to be a bus captain at our church must wear a dress to the knee. See, the problem is bearing the thigh. God says in 1 Timothy 2, 9, Let women adorn themselves in modest apparel. The word that describes modest apparel is a garment that does not bear the thigh. The ladies in the Old Testament that bear the thigh had a name. They were called the daughters of Babylon. You know what a daughter of Babylon was? The Bible described her as a great whore. And the ladies in the Bible that bear the thigh were ladies who were described that way. Don't get mad at me. By the way, the lady that designed the miniskirt was a woman who said that she designed the dress so that the man could see her in it and know there's a woman I can get anything from at any time of the day. You ladies that want to bear your thighs, God have mercy on you. I was in church not long ago, and he said, one of the fellows said, Well, you can't really describe where the thigh begins. And his wife come up, and she had on one that was about come about that far. And I said, Boy, she's got a long thigh. You know, it's up there a long ways. Haven't you ever heard that song? The thigh bone connected to the knee bone. <laughs> or the hip bone. It's from here is the knee to there is the hip. This should be, I have a poem. You might like it. I think that I shall never see a thing as ugly as a knee. A knee above whose gnarled and knotty crest a mini hemline comes to rest. Or one that's worse, even than that, one covered with repulsive fat. Some knees continue to perplex. How can they form a perfect X? While in another set one sees a pair of true parentheses. Fools may quote lines like these, but bigger fools display their knees. <laughs> So we don't have any ladies dressed that way. All right, number three. Bus captain should be taught to be faithful in five areas of his Christian life. Faithful, reading his Bible daily. Faithful in praying daily. Faithful in witnessing daily. Faithful in tithing. Faithful in church attendance. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, bus captain should be there unless he's providentially hindered. What does it mean to say you're providentially hindered? It means you've got a broken back, a broken neck, you're in the hospital, or you're in... Pushing up daisies. It doesn't mean if you've got a belly ache or, or a headache or your corns are acting up, you've got a sore throat. The devil will give you those things to keep you whole. If you got something like that, just come on to church and be miserable with the rest of us. If you want a, you want a reference on providentially hindered, I'll give it to you. You might write it down and help you sometime. You're talking to somebody. Tell them it's found in the book of Vineyard, chapter 7 and verse 3. <laughs> Teach people to be faithful. Number four, bus captain must be loyal. Loyal. Loyal to the pastor. Loyal to the program of the church. Loyal to what's going on. These people that go around and sow discard, you don't need them. Fire them. Let them go join the Methodists. Tell them to leave you alone. Teach them to be loyal. Number five. The bus captain should be a pastor to his people. We use ladies as captains. We don't call them bus pastors. We call them bus captains. Why? 
Bible says that the person that's a pastor must be the husband of one wife, and a lady can't qualify on that. Number six, the bus captain should be a planner and a promoter. A planner and a promoter. Why did this young man have 265 on his bus Sunday? Because he planned to have 265. He promoted to have a day like he had. Bus captain should do that. Number seven, in our church, the bus captain is responsible for obtaining his driver. He must get his driver for Sunday. Be it, we ran 135 buses this past Sunday. We've averaged 130 for the last five weeks. We've averaged 5,358 for the last five weeks on those 130 buses. It'd be impossible for one person, me, to line up all those drivers, so I'll place that responsibility upon them. Number eight, the bus captain should ride the bus, and his or her wife also. Now, ladies, I've heard all the excuses. Don't come up here and give me one. I've heard every excuse I've ever been uttered about why a woman can't ride a bus on Sunday. And you don't have any new ones. I've heard them all. Number nine, the bus captain should be responsible for discipline on the bus. Discipline on the bus. How's the best way to have good discipline? Use a quiet seat prize. A quiet seat prize. Lots of times our captains will get on the bus and they'll holler, Hey, boys and girls, i got a picture of George Washington here. I'm going to pick out one seat. And the boy or girl sitting on that seat, if they're good and quiet, all the way to church, all the time during church, and all the way back home, when you go to get off the bus, I'll give you this picture of George Washington. How many of you would like to have it? Lift your hand. Hand it in his seat. All right. There he is. He wants it. See, he thinks he's on a bus. You say, Brother Vineyard, you're bribing him. No, you're stupid. A bribe is a promise or a payment to get a child or a person to do something wrong. To get them to do something wrong. That's what a bribe is. Am I getting them to do something wrong? You say, well, you're paying them a dollar. Listen, I've seen the day I'd pay them ten dollars. <laughs> the noisier I, they get, the more inflation sets in in my pocketbook, mother. My money just has no value at all. <laughs> when you give, Listen, the day we took that picture right there, I'd have gave a hundred dollars for the kind of quiet that I wanted that day. Discipline. And then the last thing, the bus captain is responsible to visit a minimum of three hours a week. A minimum of three hours a week. Now, many of our bus captains visit far longer than that. Many of our, I had a fellow that had 311 on three buses Sunday. 311 on three buses Sunday. They went visiting about 8.30 in the morning on Saturday morning, and they visited till 11 o'clock Saturday night. That's why I had 311, because they visited all day and part of the night. You gotta love the Lord to be in the bus ministry, you should. Out yonder in heaven, though, there'll be people. I think about that little Lopez boy that, I don't know whether he rode your bus or rode Brother Earl's bus, Jimmy Lopez. Used to come and sit. The first Sunday we started that bus in North Chicago, the one I told you about a while ago, where that little boy rode the bus. Used to come and sit about, right out there, in the main auditorium when I preached on Sunday morning. And I'd see that little boy and I'd get up there and preach and he's there every Sunday. Got saved the first Sunday, rode the bus. Got baptized that Sunday, too. That boy rode the bus and he sat out there all the time. Right before Christmas, he told his, his bus captain, he said, I'm going to get my mom and daddy to come and ride the bus. But he never did because he went to heaven the next day. Went to heaven. And he's there now and he'll be there forever. And I don't see his little face anymore when I get up to preach to those kids. But one of these days I'll see him again. Why will it? Because of a bus captain that loved the Lord and wanted to see boys and girls say, Listen, a lot depends upon the captain. And I believe this, folks. I believe there's godly heroes today that are unsung, but out yonder in glory, there'll be some. You'll get your reward out there. The devil works on you now, but you stay in there. You do what God wants to do, and he'll bless you for it. Let's pray. Father, bless what's transpired here. Now we take a short break. We pray that you'll bless in the next hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bible now and open it to Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. Paul said there, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. We're going to talk about motivating practices for bus captains, things that will better equip them on a weekly basis to be the kind of captain that they ought to do, ought to be. Let's pray, though, before we talk about it. Father, bless now through the power of the Holy Spirit this hour in Jesus' name.
Amen. All right. What do we teach our bus captains some practices to follow every week to make them successful? I'm going to give you these. You write them down. Keep them if you're a bus captain. Look at them. Pray about them. Ask God to, to enrich your life so that it would be what I'm trying to teach to you here this afternoon. Number one, do everything that you do because of souls. You ought to be in the bus ministry because of souls. If you're in the bus ministry because the preacher brags on you, since you have a lot on your bus, you have the wrong motivation. If you get your feelings hurt when somebody else beats you, you have the wrong motivation. What you do ought to be done with the consideration of souls as the motivation. Number two, minimize your problems. Minimize your problems. There's people here today that do a lot more than you can if you wouldn't look at your problems so much. Minimize your problems. Number three, no griping is allowed. No griping is allowed. If you have problems, don't gripe about it. By the way, I measure the success that I'm having by the amount of problems which faces me. I can always tell you at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning how many we're going to have on the buses. You know why? From 6.15, the time I get to the bus barn, until 8 o'clock, the amount of problems that I have determines to me, I, I'll get a good idea. I know what we're going to do from the problems I'm having. And if from, uh, from 6.15 to 8 o'clock on Sunday morning and even on Saturday night, if I have all kinds of problems, I can usually tell we're going to have a good day. But if I come through Saturday night without many problems to get out there and everything runs smoothly till about 8 o'clock in the morning, I know it's not going to be so good. Now, I'll guarantee you it works like right that. Problems. You see, you have problems because the devil knows you've got to do something for God. Now, don't make a lot out of your problems. Minimize them. Don't gripe about them when they come. We don't allow any griping at all on Sunday. None whatever. None whatever. That was the only change that I implemented when I went up there. I said, we'll not have any griping on Sunday. I don't care who you are. If you come around here griping on Sunday, I'm going to fire you. I don't care if you're the Pope's nephew. I'm going to fire you. You're fired. And so we don't have, allow any griping on Sunday. You know what griping does? It quenches the power of the Spirit of God to work. And most churches in America don't have the results that they could because the people in the church run their mouth and gripe and complain on Sunday. I have people come in. I, the other day, that day that it rained, I had folks coming in without windshield wipers from North Chicago. Glory to God, Brother Vineyard. Made it 35 miles through the rain without a windshield wiper. What a privilege. Praise the Lord. I said, hallelujah, it could have been snow. <laughs> now, don't allow any griping on Sunday, see. You know what happens? They start griping and God's Spirit doesn't work like He can. All right, the next thing. Keep your objectives in mind. Keep your objectives in mind. What am I talking about there? You'll be out visiting on the bus ride. Isn't it amazing how you'll walk up to a door and you'll knock on the door and you'll be standing there and it's a cold day, kind of misty and rainy and cold. And you'll be standing there praying that you'll be able to get some kids in that house or get some people in that house to ride your bus. And the devil will remind you about that Pharisee that took the bus workers or the bus kids anyway. And he'll remind you about him and how he's sitting home watching the ball game, sitting before the fireplace. You're out there getting cold. And you're trying to get more of those people that's going to give you more problems. And you'll be thinking, how many of you bus workers ever been out on Saturday and you're knocking on doors and the devil's telling you about people in the church that you don't even want to think about? Lift your hand and let me see. Uh, see? That's what he does. Listen, you keep your mind on your objective. Brother, he'll get you discouraged. That, that's the greatest tool the devil uses on God's people right there, brother. That right there. Somebody, somebody that's doing something for God, he'll always bring up that old Pharisee. Uh -huh. Think about him, Jim. Think about him a while. You get to think about that burden, you'll get backslid. See, keep your mind on your objectives. Keep your mind on your objectives. The next thing, do not be selfish. Do not be selfish. If God's people will do more for others than they do for self, they'll have God's blessing upon them. The Bible says in Matthew 27, 42, He saved others. Jesus did. Himself, He cannot save. I was out visiting this past December, and I saw one of our ladies who's a poor lady, who's a widow, who lives by herself. 
And this lady, it was cold that day, that real cold winter day we had, and the wind was blowing. And I, I had on an overcoat, and I had on a scarf, and I had on a hat, and had some earmuffs, and I had overshoes on. I had my long johns on, too. I had everything. I was warm. I was in my car, and I saw this dear, sweet little old widow lady out there knocking on the door. And one of the helpers on one of our buses, and she, she looked cold to me. She had on a tattered coat. She didn't have any overshoes on. And I gave that sweet woman $20 and asked her to, to buy herself some overshoes. And we took up a bus offering the next bus workers meeting we had. And that sweet little old lady put that $20 in that bus workers offer, in that bus offering to buy buses and come and told me. She said, Brother Vineyard, I think God would be more pleased if I gave that to buy a bus that somebody else could ride rather than me using it on myself. And that broke my heart. And I went along and got on my knees and asked God to forgive my old black heart the way it was. And I went to and got one of our other ladies and told this lady, I said, you go get her and you take her out and you buy her some overshoes and don't you take no for an answer like that. I mean, really, that, it made me feel miserable. But you get people that are doing things for others and they'll have God's power upon God's in favor of these little old dirty, snotty, mean mischievous kids getting saved and these mothers and fathers that don't have anything and don't look good as church members and all that. God's in favor in your church or not. I remember a lady we had, one of my best illustrations, I guess. We reached this lady and she rode the bus and she wasn't much to look at. Really, she was. She was a lot to look at. She wasn't any different than lots of other ladies except for her proportion. She had a lot of proportion. She was five foot one and weighed 357 pounds. You say, how in the world do you know that? I asked her. I asked her. I was in the baptistry the day she come to get baptized. And I'm very graceful when I get up there. I baptize everybody in the baptistry and sprinkle the choir, mix that Baptist and Methodist doctrine. I baptized the man and sent him out this way, and just as he went out, I thought Noah had come back. I thought we was right in the middle of the flood because the water rose about a foot. And I turned around, and there she was. And I began to size that little lady up looking on her for a handle hole somewhere where I could get a hold of her, you know. You think I'm kidding? Her neck be like holding a watermelon out like that. I put my hand over the microphone, and I said, ma'am, we've got a problem. That's an understatement of the year. I said, now, I'll not be able to get you by the neck, but I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my hand and I'm going to get your hair like that. And I said, I'm going to take my other hand and I'm going to get your nose like that. Really, I wanted to get her like this. And I said, now, ma'am, when I get you like that, you take both of your hands and fold them like this and put them over my forearm. And I said, please hold on tight and don't panic. She said, fine, and I instructed her well. And I asked her if she'd received Christ as her Savior, and she had, said she had, and I stuck my hand up in the air like that. I don't know why preachers stick their hand up in the air. I've been baptized a long time, and they always did it, and so I do it too. I stick my, I still don't know why they put their hand up in the air. I put my hand in the air, and uh, I said, I baptize you upon your, your profession of faith in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I took all of my adrenaline and got it worked up. And I took my left hand and I went whoop, like that and I got the back of her hair and I took my right hand and I went go whack and I got that nose like that and I took my left foot and got it out there behind her good like this and then I had her like this and I got the shake she's just like that and I began to shake and I started shakingly down with her. Must have scared her. She put that thing in reverse then, brother, and she went whoom like that and she started backwards. And then she hit my left leg. And when she hit my left leg, I had her, or she had me just perfect for a judo throw. And she started down and pulled on my right arm. And when she did, listen, when a 357-pound woman pulls a 185-pound preacher, he has to go. And so I went to whack. And I hit that water. Skaplash. Very gracefully like she took her right leg and hooked it over my body like that. And then I went glub, glub, glub down under the water. And then she got on top of me. And then she started kicking the water. Called, wah, wah, wah. She was bouncing water 30 foot in the air. I'm down under the water thinking my stars, this woman's going to drown me. 
Finally, I fought my way over to the side, and I'm looking back at her like that, hanging on. The preacher's down there about her, you didn't get her under! I said, you try it! We had nine other people left to baptize. I said, that's all. Don't be selfish. All right, settle down. <laughs> the next thing, teach your bus workers not to be negative, be positive. You know what's the matter with some of you people here today? You're too negative-minded. I can do all things through Jesus Christ which strengthens me. That, that's either true or it's a lie. You run around and you say, well, I can't do it. I got this problem. Yeah, uh, the bus worker, uh, the director of your church sets a, a goal for you to reach. And you say, well, I don't know. The people out in my neighborhood there, it's pretty hard to get them to come. Now, Brother So-and-so over where he runs his bus, it's different over there. And the people in my area don't come to you, hypocrite. You're just negative. You're just like most of these deadbeat preachers all across this country. You don't want to be like him. Be positive about it. If he can do it, I can. That's the way I look at it. That's the way you ought to look at it. The same God is doing it for him over there. Look for you. If you get around your excuses. I don't let people utter those negativisms around me, brother. I'll rebuke them about that. They'll say something to me and I'll say that's negative. Not right. I'll crawl their hide about that. That's negative. That's negative. Don't talk that way. That's negative. I don't even want to hear it. That's negative. Be positive. Be positive. Be positive. Went to Hammond last fall. Brother Howes told me, he said, to be happy if we averaged what we did last spring on the buses. They averaged almost 3,000. I was there two weeks. We set a goal to average 4,000 on the buses last fall. I believed we could do it. That's half of the job, see, being positive and believing we can do it. I set out. I said, we can do it. I began to sell our bus captain. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. And blessed be God, we did it. We averaged 4,114. During the wintertime, we set a goal this spring to average 5,000 on the buses. Well, the house is beginning to believe we can do it now. We're averaging 5,358. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. You know why most people don't like to set a goal? They're afraid they won't make it. You know why they're afraid they won't make it? Because they're negative about it. Be positive about it. We can do it. We're going to average 6,000 this fall. Next spring, we're going to average 7,000. Next fall, 8,000. Next spring, 9,000. Next fall, 10,000. You ever think about 10,000 people riding the buses? Praise the Lord. One of these days we'll have buses all over. I can just see a thousand buses running in Chicago. <laughs> Everywhere. Man, Brother Howes don't like to shout. I do. Glory! Man, you won't have any place to park them. We don't even have that now for 135. But when we get a thousand of them, we'll just run them by the church and their riders will get off and go in and be taught the Bible and the driver will listen to the service on a transistor radio and make a great big circle. And the time he gets around the circle, it'll be time for him to pick up his riders again. Hallelujah! Got eight million people up there to work on. We can run a lot of buses reach that many people, see. Be, be positive-minded about it. The next thing, I could spend a whole day on that right there. The next thing, never show your discouragement. You get out on your bus route on Saturday and you knock on the door and the kids say, we're not going to come tomorrow. That ruins your day of visitation. You get down in the mouth and you're down in the mouth the rest of the day. You get a case of the Mississippi Mulligrubs and you show it to everybody else. Don't show it. Don't let it show. You say, what do you do about it, Brother Vineyard? Well, I'll tell you what I do about it. People ask me how I'm doing. I say, I'm doing just fine. Glory to God. I guess I'm lying. I don't know. The Bible says rejoice in all things. Now, it's hard for me to rejoice in all things, but I rejoice whether I feel like rejoicing or not. Now, somebody here past say, oh, well, you shouldn't talk about it that way. Well, I don't see any other definition to it than that. See? But don't let it show, because what you have, somebody else will catch it. See? What you have, somebody else is going to get. And I'd rather be... Happy whether I feel don't feel like being... By the way, Saturday is your worst day for feeling bad. Saturday's the day you got... You might well expect that. Saturday's the day I'm going to feel my worst. Glory! I can go ahead and do it anyway. Whether you feel bad or good or indifferent. 
Why do you do it? Because you should. See? But don't let your discouragement show. All right? The next thing. The bus worker ought to be energetic. Energetic. A common denominator that I've found about every great man of God is that this com- these great men have been energetic. They've exercised a lot of energy, whether they had the energy or not. Now, more, most of you people sitting here today can do more than you're doing. You've got yourself believing that you need eight or nine hours sleep a night. And you don't. And I can prove it to you. You do this. If you would get up an hour earlier every morning for six months, you thought I was going to say a short while. Eh? If you'll do it for six months, you'll get used to it. And then get up an hour, hour earlier after that for the next six months, and you'll get used to it. I get by on about four to five hours sleep a night. Now, I don't ever feel like doing anything, but I do it because I ought to. And after a while, I fake myself out. And I begin to think, boy, i got a lot of energy. Glory to God, you know. And I just get all stirred up. Well, you ought to be energetic. Whether you feel like it or not, you ought to show people you got energy. All right, the next thing. The bus captain, while he visits on Saturday, ought to be friendly. I mentioned that a while ago. He ought to be friendly. The next thing. The bus captain, while he visits on Saturday, ought to speak to every person in every house where he visits. He ought to speak to every person in every house where he visits. Every one of them. The next thing. He ought to take a personal interest in people and their problems. The bus captain ought to take a personal interest in people and their problems. The next thing. He ought to be excited while he visits. The best bus captains I have are those that get out and get excited about it. I know a fellow that lives up in Indiana. He's not in our church, in another church. This man, little bitty short guy. He, he, he weighs about 110 pounds. His nickname, he calls himself Big Al. He bought himself a cowboy hat, a cowboy suit, boots, two Colt 45 pistols, and bandoliers to carry all kinds of ammunition. He bought himself a blank-making outfit. Now, his bus route runs in a neighborhood where the homes begin at $35,000. This old boy loves the Lord. He gets out there, there's a, Episcopalians and Lutherans and Catholics live out there, and they're the most unexcited people you'd ever find in your life. You know what he does on Saturday while he visits? He never knocks on the door. You know what he does? He walks up in the front yard and he plants his feet and he hollers like a wild Indian and he whips out those two Colt 45s and he's got them full of powder. I mean, he, feel, he those blanks he makes are full of powder. And he whips those things out and he goes, boom, boom, like that. And the kids come busting out the doors to see Big Al. His preacher told me, he, his preacher said the Episcopalians down the street have to order their kids to stay home because of all that ruckus that old Big Al stirs up. He's excited. And excitement's what draws folks to you. Get excited about it. You get out, you find yourself... Not being excited? Well, get excited. Might have to work it up a few times. Nothing wrong with that. Get excited. Get excited. The next thing, be brief in your visiting. Really, it's a law of large numbers. I have bus captains that knock on 300 homes, doors, on Saturday. They'll call on 300 homes. 300 homes. Now, you can't spend a lot of time there. you got to get in, make a visit, and get out. Get in, make a visit, and get out. The next thing, pray at every home before you leave that home. Pray at every home before you leave that home. Pray at every home before you leave that home. Pray for people. The next thing, some of you here today say, Now, Brother Vineyard, if I know you, you'll say, I, I, I thought you should teach people they ought to leave people to the Lord on Saturday. Should you bus visit and try to lead people to the Lord on Saturday too? My next point is this, and it'll answer your question. The point is this, be Holy Spirit led. Be Holy Spirit led. Be Holy Spirit led. What would the Holy Spirit lead you to do? He'll lead you. I've seen the day I've knocked on 20 doors. Boom, 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 boom just like that. And not leading anybody to the Lord, but on the 24th, 21st door, stop and lead somebody to Jesus Christ. People have been with me and say, why in the world did you do that here and you do it and didn't do it in the rest of the places? And all I can say is, well, the Holy Spirit impressed me to do it here and He didn't in the rest of the places. That's why. You pray and ask the Spirit of God to lead you and He will. 
because he knows what can be done. The further I go in the ministry, and I haven't been in it too long, six years, but the further I go, the more I see the dependence that God's people ought to exercise on the Holy Spirit. You do it that way and God will lead you. All right, the next thing. Be polite and tactful as you visit. Now, let me remind you about something. You don't separate a sinner from his sin and get him to Jesus. You get him to Jesus, and the Holy Spirit separates him from the sin. We ought to, we ought to preach at the, at the Christians. We ought to jump all over them about their sins, like I did a while ago, like Brother Howes does. But to the sinner, be polite and tactful. The next thing, be patient. Be patient with people. You'll have kids ride your bus, and they'll get saved, and they'll go home and tell Mom and Daddy got saved and want to get baptized. Mom and Daddy say, you can't go over there anymore. You'll come by and the parent will tell you about it and you'll show yourself and lose the writer completely. Where if you'd have just been patient and kind and sweet and loving and stayed in there and kept pitching, you'll get those kids back. Be patient. The next thing, and this is a big thing here, be courageous. Be courageous. You know what fear is? Fear is the element that keeps you from doing what you ought to do. I have days, even today, I walk up the sidewalk and... Somebody will come to the door, and while I'm waiting on somebody to come, I'll stand there hoping nobody's home. You know what that is? That's fear. You know what courage is? Courage is that element that'll make you stand and wait till they come. What are most of you people here afraid of today? Dogs? How many of you people afraid of dogs? Lift your hand. How many of you lie? All the rest of you lift your hand. You're afraid of dogs. You know what you should do if you're afraid of dogs? Get yourself a good water pistol. A good water pistol. Now, don't buy a cheap one. Get a good one and fill it with vinegar. Fill it with vinegar. I was in, in Lynchburg and we was visiting Bedford County one day and knocked on the door. Oh, well, we didn't yet, but uh, the bus captain told me, he said, the fellow's got a great big mean German Shepherd dog, and he did. We come up and they had a fenced-in yard. And we come up to the gate and the dog's on the other side of the gate just waiting to get at us, wanting to eat my right leg. And I took, I had this water pistol in my pocket like this. Now be sure to get a good one, because if you get a cheap one, it'll leak. I was out one day with a bus captain, and his was in his pocket, and it leaked. And he come down the street, Brother Vineyard, I got to go to the car like that. And he smelled like a wino. But anyway, get a good one. And that dog come up, and he's kicking up a, a, a storm on the other side of the fence. And I reached in my pocket and pulled out that water pistol and let him have it four times right in the eyes. He got the idea. And he took off the other way. He stuck his head down on the grass. And he'd run about 20 foot and he'd stop and he'd paw at his eyes and he'd whine and he'd run in a circle. And then he'd take off and run 20 more foot and stop and paw at his eyes and run in a circle. I walked on in, walked up and knocked on the door. The man come to the door and I stood there talking to him for at least a minute. Finally he looked out and he saw his dog. And he said, Good night, what's the matter with that dog? I turned around and looked at the dog. I said, looks to me like he's got something in his eyes. <laughs> Thank God dogs can't talk. <laughs> be courageous. Don't be a coward. I was out in Black Oak the other day, and nine dogs got after me at the same time. I didn't have a water pistol. I had an umbrella, and I was fighting dogs and kicking them. I had a fellow visiting with me that, that day, and he got up in the back of a guy's pickup. Well, I was... Taking on all those dogs. <laughs> be courageous. The next thing, every bus captain ought to be a soul winner. Ought to be a soul winner. Every bus captain ought to be a soul winner. The next thing, every bus captain ought to go out at night to win mamas and daddies to Jesus Christ. Visit your bus route on Saturday and then go back out at night. By the way, all of you captains here, all of you men, you ought to do this one night a week. All you men that are married, every one of you men that are married, one night a week, you ought to date your wife. You ought to have a date with your wife. Now, I've made a practice for years. I have one night a week I have a date with my wife. Right now, it's every Thursday night. She and I has a date. We'll go visiting together. We'll go soul winning together. We'll go, we'll go out and visit together. And then I'll take her out and buy her something to eat. I'll buy her a hamburger or cheeseburger, fish sandwich, or if I'm flush, I'll buy her a steak. And I'll sit across the table from her and sweet talk her. She'll sit there. She likes it. I like it too. <laughs> now, you men think it's silly, but I'll tell you what, for two or three days after I do that, 
She'll follow me around just like that, eating out of my hand. You ought to date your wife one night a week. How many of you wives like for your husband to date you one night a week? Lift your hand, let me see. Look at them, brother. They stick them up in a hurry. The ones that go up slow have good-for-nothing husbands. Date your wife. Date your wife. Date your wife. Do that. You dated her while you was trying to get her. Why did you stop after you got married? There's no, don't make sense. Go out at night to win the mamas and daddies to Jesus Christ. The next thing. Be prepared for emergencies. Be prepared for emergencies. Mentally, if you're ready for emergencies, you can, you can do a lot better job than you can otherwise. What am I talking about? What would you do if a kid had dirty diapers halfway to the church on Sunday morning on your bus? That happens. What do you do if a kid gets sick and throws up? You know what children do when they get sick? They're riding along like this on the bus. They don't lean forward and go down between their legs like that. When they start getting sick, they get dizzy. You know what they do? They lean back like this, and they get dizzy, and that swaying motion of the bus gets them. And they sway around a little bit, and then all of a sudden it gushes out. It just shoots out like that, see. And usually the one that gets sick is sitting halfway back in the bus. All right, up about three seats in front of him, little Billy's sitting there just minding his own business, being good for the first time in six weeks. And all of a sudden, something juicy comes slapping over his right shoulder. And he looks down, and it's got chunks in it. You know what happens to Billy? He starts getting dizzy. Billy sits back like this, and then he lets it go, and there it is, all over the bus. One day, one of our buses come pulling into the parking lot, and everybody on the bus was sitting up on the back seats like this. And I thought, good night, what in the world's the matter? And I jumped up on the bus, and there it was, squishing around all over the floor. Nine kids got sick on that bus. What am I saying? Be prepared for emergencies. How many of you glad you come so far? All right. <laughs> the last thing. The bus captain ought to be persistent. 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 If you'll be persistent, you can get people saved. That means if you'll go back and see them. That means if you'll go back and see them again. That means if you'll go back and see them again and again and again and again and again. It isn't how much you know that will make a success out of you. It's how well you know what little you know and how often you do what little you know. If you'll do it over and over again, you'll be successful. Be persistent. Be persistent. Stay at it. Stay at it. Stay at it. Stay at it. All right, now, let's change the subject, and let's talk about a failure of the bus ministry for just a little bit. A failure of the bus ministry, and I want to help you to try to correct this, and that failure is a failure to win mamas and daddies to Jesus Christ. And I want to give you a number of points that you ought to follow about winning parents to the Savior. Winning parents to the Savior. Number one, you ought to believe that you can win mamas and daddies to Jesus Christ. You ought to believe that you can win mamas and daddies to Jesus Christ. I remember when I was at a church in Cincinnati, Ohio, we had a fellow that we reached his, his, his daughter and his wife with one of our buses, and uh, somebody asked me to go see him, and I went out there, and he was a mean devil. And then he beat up his wife one time. I, I stopped going to see him because he's too mean. And uh, he beat up his wife. Black both her eyes, and Dr. Rawlins told me he wanted me to go out and see him. Scared me to death. I was about, at that time, I was as much afraid of John Rawlins as I was God. And I, I was scared. And I went off out in the woods on top of the hill and got on my knees, and for four solid hours I prayed. Oh, I prayed about that man. Dr. Rawlins said, I want you to go out there and get that man saved today. I prayed. By the way, I confessed my sins when I started. It didn't help any, so I confessed my wife's sins. And then I confessed her mother's sins. And I confessed everybody's sins I knew. But about 3.45 that afternoon, I be began to believe that I could lead that man to Jesus Christ. I, something came over me, and I felt that I could do it. I hopped up off my knees out in the woods, and I ran as fast as I could and got in the car, and I drove over that man's house as fast as I could, 85 miles an hour, got out of the car and run up, knocked on the door. His wife came to the door. I said, where's that good-for-nothing husband of yours? She said, he's out in the backyard drinking a beer. I said, go tell him there's a man here wants to see. She went and hollered at him, come back and said, he don't want to come. I thought about Dr. Rollins. I marched through the house, and they had a back storm door on their house, sort of a screen door. I very gently showed my karate on that door. I know karate and judo and 
three other Japanese words. I come through the house and I get that door open like that and stood it open and I said, Hey, you coward, come up here and let a man talk to you. He was drinking a beer and he set that beard out and he doubled up his fist like that. And here he comes. I began to look around for that man that wanted to converse with him. If you start something and you don't know whether you can finish it or not, fake it. So what I did is he got close to the house. I just put a scowl in my face like this and looked at him. I said, get in here. He walked right past me. Went in and sat down. I went in and sat down beside him, took my Bible out and showed him how to get saved. I said, get out on your knees. He dropped down on his knees. I said, ask the Lord to save you. Old boy said, dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I'm going to hell. Please save me today. Just like that. Praise the Lord. Today, he's one of the Sunday school workers at the Landmark Baptist Temple in Cincinnati, Ohio. How simple. You know when I led that man to the Lord? Not there beside the couch, out there in the woods, when I believed that I could. And that's the way it is about winning mamas and daddies to Jesus Christ. Number two. Number two. Exercise what I call aggressive vision. God's people are not aggressive enough. They ought to be aggressive. I mean God's people ought to get stirred up and be aggressive. You know, the world's intimidated Christianity long enough. It's time God's people rose up on our hind legs and intimidated the world. You ought to read to make yourself aggressive. You ought to study to make yourself aggressive. You ought to be aggressive for God. That's the way you get parents saved. Number three, don't fear the difficult. Don't fear the difficult. You have mamas and daddies that will be difficult to you just because the devil wants them to be difficult. And you become frightened of them. More than any other thing in the Gospels, the Lord Jesus commanded His people to fear not. Don't be afraid of the difficult. Go ahead. Go ahead and try to win them. The next thing, set goals on your bus route to have so many adults saved and walk the aisle every month. The first Wednesday night of the year, I set a goal at our church. I didn't set a goal. I, I challenged our bus captains to set a goal. Wanted every bus captain to set a goal to have so many adults saved every month off of his bus and walk the aisle. Walk the aisle. This past Sunday, one of our bus captains come to me Sunday night after the service rejoicing. He said, Brother Vineyard, I've already got my goal for this month. He said, a goal to have two adults walk the aisle every month off his bus. He said, I've already got my goal for this month. I had two walk the aisle today that led the Lord in the home yesterday. And he said, they both got baptized. And he said, now I can sit around the rest of them. The rest of the month. Praise the Lord. He said a go. The next thing, use the adult department's Sunday school campaigns to reach the parents on the bus ride. I'm afraid in most churches we don't use the adult levels of the Sunday school to reach mamas and daddies for Jesus Christ like we could. Now use it. Use it. Take those adult Sunday school classes in departments and have attendance campaigns. I remember a sweet little lady at Landmark Baptist Temple. During an eight-week campaign, brought 116 adult first-time visitors to Landmark Baptist Temple to win a trip to go to the Holy Land. Bless her heart. Thirty-seven of those 116 got saved. We let them in the Lord in the home or else they got saved at the church. That sweet little lady won that trip to go to the Holy Land. We was over the Holy Land out in the Valley of Elah where David killed Goliath out there picking up those smooth stones. And at that time, the, the tourists had all come over and picked up every smooth stone of any size. The Jews fake out the Gentiles. So they go up in the north land and load up a gravel truck with smooth stones and bring it down there and they spread them out on that brook. And the tourists, they just keep coming and going out there and picking up the smooth stone. The day we were there, you couldn't find the stone any bigger than a BB. Rose Delliman was this lady. She went out there and picked up five of those little old bitty BBs, put them in her hand, got back on the bus. She said, I don't have any place to keep these. Another lady said, here's an empty pill bottle. Rose said, can I have it? And she said, yes. And put those smooth stones in that pill bottle and put them in her purse. That night she was in her hotel room getting ready for bed and she went in, washed her face like this and got herself a glass of water and come back out to take her medicine, opened her purse and reached down there and got what she thought was her medicine out, flipped the lid off and dumped out two of what she thought was her pills in her hand, put some water in her mouth like that and slapped that in her mouth and swallowed two of those smooth stones. We call her Gravel Gertie. <laughs> All the rest of that trip. But use the adult departments to reach the parents. The next thing, saturate in visitation. Every adult prospect that you have living on your bus route, if possible, should be visited by a soul winner every ten days, in addition to the bus visitation. They should be visited by a soul winner every ten days. The next thing, 
the pastor and the staff of the church should pray on a daily basis for these mamas and daddies. Dr. Jerry Falwell would pray for the parents of our bus riders. Dr. Jack Howes will pray for the parents of our bus riders. All our bus captains have to do is give either one of those men a name and they'll pray for them. They'll pray for them. I remember a, a lady we had saved at, at, uh, at Thomas Old Baptist Church. This lady had cancer, and she read that portion of the Scripture in the Bible about call for the elders of the church and let them come and anoint with oil. We had a staff member up there. It wasn't any smarter than I was, and he and I read that, and we looked at one another, and we thought we were the elders of the church. And so uh, we went out, and I bought a quart of vegetable oil. Now, I, I'm just no ignorant boy. I don't know anything about, you know, what the Bible says about it. Most Baptists don't believe in that anyway, you know. Most Baptists would never do that. They leave that to the Pentecostals. Well, I don't know any better. If it's, if it's in the Bible, I'm just liable to do it whether it's for this dispensation or not, you know. A lot of times I get my own ignorance where you theologians, I have, I've been to college and all that, mine just didn't take. But anyway, I went out there and I borrowed a pan from that lady and I poured that, that oil in the pan. Also had a dauber brush to put it on with, you know. And I began to daub that oil on her. I thought she had to get it all over a person. I took that oil and I brushed it all over her face and then covered her hair and got it in her ears like that and around her neck and all. And I told her, I said, now we're going to go out of the room and you rub it on the rest of it. And she did. She rubbed it all over. Then we come back in there and I laid my hand on her like this and he put his hand on me like that and then I put my other hand on her and he put his hand on her like that and we laid hands on her and prayed for her. Six months later, blessed be God, I don't know whether it's an oil or the prayer or what, but the doctors could find no evidence of her cancer. We led her husband to the Lord one day. Man, I got excited the day we led that man to the Lord. She did too. She came across the floor and jumped on his back, and they rolled around on the floor like a couple of pigs rooting around and whooping and hollering, and I was right in the middle of it too, brother. Woo! Glory to God! Went outside. I had a telephone in my car then. I was a big shop preacher. I called Brother Falwell. He had a phone in his car. He was about 15 miles away. And I, I, I bellowed, Hey, Jerry! Guess what happened today? And he already knew. I said, Man, how would you know that? He said, The Lord lifted a burden from my heart. He didn't even know I was going out there. But he already knew. I said, Good night. That's spooky. <laughs> All right, the next thing. The bus captain should pray every day for these parents. The bus captain should pray every day for these parents. The next thing, you should ha have a church-wide prayer list for the parents. Circulate their names among the people in the church. Get the little old widows of the church. You bus captains, you have a difficult parent. Get their names and take them and give them to every widow in the church and ask those widows to pray for them every day. They'll love that. And they'll pray for them. They'll pray for them every day. The next thing, assign them to good families. Asking these good families to pray for them. Asking these good families to visit them. They'll pray for them and get them saved by praying for them. They'll visit them and get them saved. The next thing, use special bus promotions. Mother Day, Mother's Day is coming up. Every child that brings his mother or her mother, if the mother doesn't normally ride the bus, give that child a silver dollar. Carol Ferguson has used that. One of my fellows that's in the ministry today has a bus ministry. Had 1,100 and something on his buses the other day. Chesapeake, Virginia. Used to be a bus captain for me. Last year, he used that, and I believe he told me he had 15 mothers saved on Mother's Day because he gave away a silver dollar to every child that got their mother to come. A special bus promotion. And then the last thing again here, persistence is the key. If it don't work the first time, try it the second time. If it don't work the second time, do it the third time. If it don't work the third time, do it the fourth time. If it don't work the fourth time, do it the fifth time. Just don't give up. Keep doing it. Stay at it. Win these parents. Let's not fail at that. Last year, when I left Thomas Old Baptist Church for the first seven months of the year, our buses had averaged 1,904. Out of that 1,900, over 600 were adults. How did we do it? By doing the very thing I told you right here. We're working on that right now, where I am trying to increase the amount of adults riding the buses by winning the mamas and daddies to Jesus Christ. All right, the last thing I want to talk to you about this afternoon. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 18 and verse 14. And that's the subject of promotion. The subject of promotion. 
The Bible says in Matthew 18, 14, even so it is not, you ought to circle that word, the will of your Father which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Little ones. Let me give you a definition. The word promotion, write down the definition. As used by a local church, promotion is defined simply as the use of excitement to get folks to come. The use of excitement to get folks to come. Who does it normally apply to? The little ones. The little ones. I knocked on the door not long ago, and a lady came to the door, and she said, I don't like your church. I said, why, ma'am? She said, you bribe people to get them to come. I said, do you have a dictionary? She said, yes. I said, would you get it? She went and got it. I showed her the definition of the word bribe. A bribe is defined as a promise or a payment to get a person to do something wrong. I said, is it wrong for people to go to church? She said, no. She had three little girls standing there. I asked her a question. Before I tell you the question, I'll ask it of you. How many of you have a lost relative? Lift your hand. All right, put your hands down. All right, now, let me ask you this question. How many of you would give anything you have materially to get that lost relative saved? Lift your hand again. All right. I looked at the lady and I asked her three girls standing there. I said, ma'am, what would you give to keep one of your girls out of hell? She said, well, I'd give anything. I said, oh, why do you look down your nose at us? Because we're giving away little things to keep somebody else out of hell. See, isn't it amazing how it appears when you bring it home? And when it rests at your house, it's a little bit different, see. Now, I took her to Matthew 10, 42. Turn there. Matthew 10, 42. Jesus said there, He said, And whosoever shall, there's a key word, give, give. Whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these, what's those next two words? Little ones. A cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple. Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Jesus said, Give a cup of water, you'll not lose your reward. You'll not lose your reward. Give a cup of water, you'll not lose your reward. Go to Mark chapter 9. I showed her this in verse 41 and 42. They go together. You wouldn't think they do. The Bible says in verse 41, For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. But look at verse 42. And whosoever shall offend one of these, what's that word, those next two words? Little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. Jesus said, don't offend one of these little ones that believe in me. There's somebody here say, well, people ought to go to church because they want to. You're stupid. How about 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4? There the Bible says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto thee. See, devils put a blinder on men. Men don't want to go to church. They don't want to go to church on their own because they're blinded by Satan. Jesus knew that. You know what Jesus did? He used excitement to get folks to come. What's the definition of promotion? What did I give you a little while ago? Let me show you. Look at John chapter 6, if you would, and verse 2. John 6 and verse 2. The Bible says, And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. They followed him because. They followed him because they saw his miracles. What did they do? In this chapter, he took five loaves and two fishes and fed a multitude. Five loaves and two fishes and he fed a multitude. He preached the sermon. You'll find in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. What's that? Coming to Jesus is repentance. Believing on Jesus is faith. That's how you say repentance and faith. What did he do in John 8? He spit on his hands and healed a blind man of his blindness. Preach that sermon you'll find in John 8, 12. He said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In John 11, he did the same thing. Now, a multitude gathered in both all three of these instances. In John 11, he went down yonder to the tomb. And the lady said, my brother's been dead. Been dead four years. She said, Master, he stinketh. I'm sure he did. Dead four days. He'd stink. I just think about these Baptist churches that had been dead for 30 years. And they stinketh too, brother. I mean, they stinketh. I was in a service in a church not long ago, and they didn't like what I preached on. A bunch of dudes there. And so last message I preached in that church was the Baptist church that stinketh. The Baptist church that stinketh, brother. And I said, you, you, you. But anyway, Jesus, he didn't stop there. He had a multitude there. So what did he do? He went out and he stuck his head down in the grave and hollered, Lazarus, come forward. Old Lazarus popped out of that tomb. Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Now that's promotion. How do I know? I've done it. 
I've done it twice. Did it at Thomas Old Baptist Church, did it at First Baptist Church. What did I do? Brought a body in. Brought a body in. Wrapped that body up in gauze. One time put the body in a casket down in front in junior church. Have all the little old kids get up out of their seats and walk by that casket and look down in there at that body. Discipline is good when you do that. I got up and preached, I am the resurrection life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And got to the end of the service and hollered, Lazarus, come forth! And that body started standing up. This picture made right out here showing 2,600 kids in junior church. I preached that, sun, that sermon there that Sunday morning. That old body started standing up, a little colored kid sitting back about six rows. I thank God that boy was there that day. He gave me a good illustration. He sat there and his eyes got big and wide and all of a sudden that body stand up and he just went like this. <laughs> that isn't promotion, I'll eat your hat. What did Jesus say in Matthew 4, 19? He said, follow me and I will make you to become what? Fishers of men. How many of you people have ever been fishing? Lift your hand. When you go fishing, do you take an empty hook and throw it out there? Man... Anybody from Alabama's got more sense than that. You put something on the hook, don't you? Don't you? You put a worm on it. The fish swims along. Now, what does the fish see? He sees the worm. He swims over. What does the fish bite? He bites the worm. What does the fish get? He gets the hook. What's promotion? It's a want to. It's a want to. You visit a home like he said a while ago. My kids can go if they want to. How many of you ever heard that? My kids can go if they want to. Promotion gives them a want to. So they come. They come. What did Jesus say? Give them a cup of water. I've given a cup of water, put a goldfish in the cup, and a lid on the top. I remember the first time I ever did that. Gave it away. Well, not the first time now, but I, I remember when I did it at Thomas Old Baptist Church. I told the boys and girls in junior church, we'd run about 1,500 on the buses. I said, everybody rides our bus next Sunday, he's going to get a live goldfish. How many of you want a goldfish? Everybody lifted their hand. I said, say, is anybody here today who wants to come up on this platform next Sunday and swallow a live goldfish? Nobody lifted their hand. I said, how many of you boys and girls like to see Brother Vineyard swallow a goldfish? Every one of those little devils stuck their hand in. I said, all right. If we have 2,000 on the buses next Sunday right here on this platform, I'll swallow a goldfish. We had 2,155. They brought that goldfish in. He was scared to death. He was trying to jump out of the cup and get away. Jerry Falwell's son reached down in there and he picked him up by the tail like that and a little goldfish jerking around like this. I made a swimming pool for that goldfish in my mouth. I had that swimming pool open like this for him. And Jerry Jr. got that little old goldfish down over my mouth. Everybody got all tense watching the last few living moments of that poor little old goldfish. Got him down over my mouth like that. And all of a sudden he dropped that goldfish. That goldfish hit that swimming pool in my mouth and immediately began to dog paddle trying to get out. I closed my mouth. He tried to go out my nose. I closed my nose. That goldfish swimming around in my house. Now, you haven't lived until you let a goldfish swim around in your mouth. What a sensation. Oh, if you want a real sensation, you tilt your head back in the air like that and let him swim down your throat to your belly. I came to Hammond. I challenged our bus captains to do that. We, we set goals on our bus routes, and 27 of our bus workers swallowed goldfish. We got the hungriest bus captains in the world. We had a we had a fella, we had a doctor swallow a goldfish. We had a doctor swallow a goldfish. We had a lady set a world's record. One lady set a world's record. She swallowed the same goldfish. Three times. I told her not to swallow that goldfish backwards. They can swim uphill. You say you're not in favor of promotion. I remember a bus captain we had by the name of Tommy Neal at Landmark Baptist Temple. Took a ten-cent kite. Got a little 14-year-old boy excited to come to church. Little boy had never been to church before in his life, and he rode the bus to get a kite. Husky lad, 
came three Sundays, or he came more than that, but on the third Sunday, he got saved. He rode the bus all the time, 145 pounds. You're not in favor of promotion. I wish you'd have been with me the day the bus captain asked me to go see that boy. I wish you'd have walked into that hospital room with me that day and looked down in the face of that 14-year-old boy. I wish you'd have been there when I said, Robert, what are you in here for? I wish you'd have been there when that boy said, well, I have a serious liver disease. And I said, son, what do the doctors say about it? He said, they don't give me any hope to live. And I looked down in that face and I knew that boy knew that he was condemned to die. And I visited that boy for months after that and I saw that husky 145 pound boy waist down until he weighed less than 80 pounds. One day I went to the hospital room if you're not in favor of promotion, I wish you could have been there that day as I walked into the room, pushed the door open, and the room was dark, and over in the corner was a bed. On that bed was a form. All the way up over that form was a white sheet. Nurse came running, and she said, Are you Mr. Hill? And I said, No, ma'am, I'm Brother Vineyard from out at Landmark Baptist Temple. That nurse said, Robert just expired. You're not in favor of promotion. I wish you could have went in the room with me that day as I walked over to the bed. And I reached down and I picked that white sheet up and I looked down at the face of that little 14-year-old boy that had just stepped out for his first year of millions and millions of years with Jesus Christ. Oh, my friend, I bowed my head there that day. I thank God in heaven for a bus captain that was willing to take a 10-cent cat and to get a boy to come to Sunday school. Last fall, I went to a funeral home in East Chicago, Indiana with one of our men. Brother Garcia, one of our Spanish-speaking men. Little 12-year-old boy had ridden his bus, got him saved. Went home and told his parents and people in the neighborhood. And I stood in the funeral home that night. His mother and father were standing by the side of it, and they couldn't speak English. Brother Garcia stood and he interpreted for me. And I talked to him and they told me about how the boy had ridden the bus and how thankful they were about it. And I stood and listened and I watched as that mother and father stood there and had tears running down their face. And I come outside with that godly bus captain. And he stood and he looked at me, just a sweet man that loves the Lord. And he had tears running down his face. He said, Brother Vineyard, that boy rode my bus because of the promotion. Oh, my soul! I could not constrain the burst of joy that I had that night to know that a hundred million years from now, or longer than that, that little boy will be in heaven. That promotion didn't get him there. That bus didn't get him there. That Sunday school didn't get him there. But that Jesus that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He got him there. He got him there. But the promotion gave him a want to, to come to a place where he heard about the King of kings and Lord of lords. And that's promotion. Jesus said, even so, it is not the will of my Father that one of these little ones should perish. Would to God that God's people would be stirred to go out and reach a lost and dying world for Jesus Christ. And that's the bus ministry right there. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you today for the privilege it's been to share with these people this afternoon what little we know about the bus ministry. We pray that you'd bless it in its practical application. We pray that these people here might have your hand and your power upon them. God bless every one of them. There's some of them here today that may have been discouraged. We pray that they would rededicate and reconsecrate their lives to serving you and that you'd use them in a great and mighty way. 